And then you think, well, what kind of wolf gets to the top? And you might think the toughest wolf. That's sort of like the, the caveman theory, you know. But it's unlikely that it's the toughest wolf. It's, it's a wolf that's well adapted across multiple dimensions. But the, the wolf that's successful in the dominance hierarchy you could think of as the, the archetypal wolf. Right now, what kind of wolf is that? Well, I don't know enough about wolves to know, but I do know some things about dogs. I mean, a dog is cooperative as well as competitive, and it's it's pretty sophisticated at picking up the cues that indicate the nature of social relationships. Like it can do that in a human society. The dog doesn't know the rules, but the dog has the morality of a dominant system already built into it. So it's it's a predicate of its of its biological existence. Okay, so we'll switch to chimps, because you can actually talk a little bit more, well, with a little bit more concrete knowledge about which chimps win. This is a lot from Franz de Waal. Um, which chimp stays on top? Because male chimps make a pretty vicious hierarchy, right? And it's almost always a male on top. It's not so clear with bonobos, but or bonobos. I never know how to say that. But but the chimp that stays on top, brutal chimps can rule for a while. But because they're brutal, they're not very good at making coalitions. And even if you're brutal and strong, two guys that are half as brutal as you and three quarters as strong will take you down. And that's what the chimps do. So then you might say, well, in order to be optimally situated for maximum re reproductive potential, not only do you want to climb the hierarchy, you want to climb it without being hurt too much. You don't want to blow the, the strats out of your group and you want to stay there as long as possible. Okay, so that's a niche. Think about that, that's a niche. It's complicated, because the niche involves success in climbing, and then it involves success in maintaining an uppermost position. Okay, so, and that for chimps, that requires not only the capacity to be aggressive, but also the capacity to, to be cooperative and empathic. So one of the things DeWall discovered, for example, is that the chimp who stays on top first of all, can make coalitions, so there's a lot of reciprocal grooming and so on. So he's, he can make friends, even though he's kind of, a, you know, he's tough. But he also pays a lot of attention to the females and the infants in the troop. So, so whatever constitutes sovereignty, let's say, from a chimp perspective, is a lot more complex than mere power. Okay, so fine, so that's chimps. Now, we're chimps, so you already got the origin of human ethics to some degree in that. It's like, get to the top, but don't be too much of a prick when you're there, so to speak, right? You have to, you have to let, you have to rule while making allowances for those, for making, and make allowances for the fact that those you rule over have value. Now, that's an interesting thing, because now what you've done is if you've introduced the, not the idea, but the fact that even a defeated other is a valuable part of the group. Okay, now that, that's starting to get, morality there is starting to get fairly deep, because that's kind of like, well, the outcast still has value. Okay, now you come to human beings and think, okay, well, what's, what makes a human being successful in the dominance hierarchy? You can say, well, it's the same thing the chimps have, and that's right, except that human beings have one other thing, at least. They can make new dominance hierarchies. That's what creativity is, right? So you invent a new something, and you can erect a dominance hierarchy around it. So if you can't climb the dominance hierarchy that's already here, you can just say, well, here's a new thing, and we'll make a little dominance hierarchy over there. So now you've got the addition of the capacity to transform the dominance hierarchy as another thing that's contributing to dominance hierarchy success. Okay, so I believe that what's come out of that is the idea that this is such a great idea is that the top of the dominance hierarchy is the right place to be. But the top of all potential sets of dominance hierarchies is a better place to be. And I think we're selected to be the top of the set of potential dominance hierarchies. And that means in some sense if you're at the top, you're not at the top of a dominance hierarchy. You're at the top of... Okay, so now imagine this. So now imagine a landscape. Okay, as far as you can see, it's a plane, and there's pyramids all over it of different sizes, right? And you're 
flying above it. And you zoom into a pyramid and you see all people packed inside trying to climb to the top. But, but there's pyramids everywhere where people are doing this. But you're flying along the top. Okay, well, that's, as far as I can tell, that's the Egyptian god Horus. Horus isn't in the pyramid. He's above the pyramid. So, and he's the eye, because Horus is the eye. And so Horus stands for attention. And so there's this idea that the Egyptians start to play with that one of the most important gods is Osiris, and he's like god of the pyramid. He stands for security and stability and the past. But he can be wiped out by various means, so he's not permanent enough in some sense, or he lacks something. Father archetype, essentially? Yes, or Osiris is the father, yeah, the, the great father. It's half of the archetype because he's the po he's sort of the positive element of the great father. He's, he's not the negative element, although he makes himself susceptible to the negative element by being willfully blind. Okay, so his son is Horus, and Horus is the eye, and Horus pays attention. So the Egyptians are starting to get the idea that, well, you should be Osiris. That means you're the embodiment of the dominance heart, you say. But you also should be Horus, which is the thing that pays attention. Because the dominance heart, as it's currently structured, may be restructured. And then, so you don't want to just be adapted to this dominance heart. You want to be adapted so if it transforms its structure, that's no problem for you. Because you're not stuck in it. You're in it and not in it at the same time. And that's the big contribution of Egyptian thought. I think it's brilliant, brilliant. And if we could, just, just a slight tangent from that. So what you're talking about there is, just to make the distinction clear for other people, when the Egyptians are experimenting with these ideas and representing yeah. them in yeah. imagistic form or in, yeah. in, in hieroglyphic form, are you saying that they're doing this consciously or this is, no. this is like a, um, a some, some sort of natural it happens next, automatically next level yeah representation yeah well of think about it this way so so imagine that one of the things that characterize whether or not you can climb the dominance hierarchy is how good you are at watching people who can climb the dominance hierarchy and imitating them okay so that means that part of it's going to be built in your biology because you've been at you know the dominance hierarchy has been working on you for a long time so you have the capability of being the thing that can climb but then let's say you get an edge by watching someone who's successfully climbing because they're like adapted to the current circumstances precisely and you can imitate them. Okay, then the question is, well, what does it mean to imitate them? And what it means is you can model their behavior with your behavior. Okay, so that's a form of, that's a form of representation. Okay, now you've got it. Now, we're all watching each other and we find those people who can climb up dominance hierarchy is very interesting, so we tell we start to tell stories about them, which is the representation of behavior in image and articulation. So, it's like, you tell this story about some interesting person that you admire, and then it's a pretty good story so other people remember it, but then it sort of gets commingled in with some other stories about some interesting people who can climb the dominance hierarchy, and then thousands of you gather and those stories all have a war over centuries and what you extract out of it is like the most interesting person who's the best at climbing the dominance hierarchy and that's where you start to get the idea of the savior and so it's a bottom-up process and so and then once that's once you've started to get that well then the process can be more than merely You can start to understand and model, in some sense, what the principles are that govern success. But it's universal success, right? It's not success in a given hierarchy. It's like, what are the principles that guarantee universal success? So you might say, well, that's the ultimate question of life. It's like, yes, that is the ultimate question of life. So what did the Egyptians figure out? Well, they figured out that Osiris was a good guy. You need him. But he's kind of blind because he's old, and, be, and he's willfully blind too. And that makes him susceptible to the forces that want to overturn the hierarchy, but the negative forces, the ones that just want to destroy, that's his brother Seth. So Osiris remains willfully blind and he lets Seth basically chop him into pieces and distribute him throughout the Egyptian state, so things fall apart. And Seth rules, so the Egyptians had already figured out in models that the hierarchy can become probably corrupted by power and deceit, something like that, right? So it's no longer functioning as it should, and it can continually do that. And is 
set a descent into chaos, or that's just sort of the... It's, yeah, yeah, well, it's the, it's the demolition of order. And, well, that's when ISIS...